attraction here. <laughs> so our next speaker uh, is uh, Fleur van Leusden. Uh, she is the uh, CISO for the, uh, for the ACM. So basically this is the, uh, the Dutch, uh, the Netherlands Authority for the Consumers and Markets. And she is also a board member at the DVD, uh, the Dutch Institute for Vulnerability Disclosure. She's going to talk to you about uh, pen test reports and uh, why they don't get used. <laughs> of course, for me, this is utterly perplexing because, uh, you know, me and my team, we spend an awful lot of time <laughs> writing uh, pen test reports, and I'm extremely curious to hear the reasons why they might not get used. So. Um, I guess with that, um, I guess Fleur, if you uh, would like to come up. Wonderful. So uh, with this, I guess uh, we are just about on time. So I am going to hand things over to you. Thank you. <laughs> you. Melanie Reback, of course. Um, yay. Why talk? A CISO approach to pen testing, and why so many reports are never used. But first, let me tell you a little something that happened to me uh, last year. We had a pen test at the, uh, the place where I work, and we had, this was actually a fully digital pen test, but for some reasons I cannot tell you about right here, there was part of this pen test that had to be on site. So the pen testers were actually in our office doing their digital test. Um, and one day, they were walking down the hall, and they saw this, our lockers. And these lockers are secured by pin codes. And one of the pen testers jokingly said to my security officer that was with him, you know, why, why don't you let me just try, you know, just one. Let me try one code on one locker, just for shits and giggles, you know. And my security officer, uh, unfortunately, said, sure, why not? This sounds like fun. And the pen tester went off, chose a random locker, went one, two, three, four, enter, and of course, the locker opened. And this turned out to be a locker of someone quite important within our organization who did not appreciate this test very much. <laughs> because scoping, y'all, but uh, yeah. Um, apart from, of course, the fact that it's uh, not a very smart move to have a 1, 2, 3, 4 as your code, uh, it's very important to have a scope for your test and stick to it for multiple reasons, which I'll get to it in a moment. Uh, first of all, I'm just wondering, I'm going to do a poll right here with you guys, um, because I've noticed that a lot of us don't actually know this, but managers don't know a lot about IT generally, if, unless they're IT managers. Um, so what I did was I asked a random group of Dutch managers, which I don't personally know, uh, who are not in IT, which, what, the, what they thought the word checksum meant. And I, just, I, I was kind of in a friendly mood, so I gave them three options. I didn't ask them right out. I, I asked them, um, do you think it means a, a digit representing the sum of the correct digits in data, which can be made to detect errors? Spoiler alert, of course, this is the correct answer. Or do you think it means a sum of multiple vulnerable systems that have been checked for the same known vulnerability over the course of multiple tests? Or they could say it's a way to check that a computer system has not been hacked recently. Now, for you guys, I'm wondering what you think most of the managers thought the word checksum means. So I'd like you to raise your hand if you think most of the managers I asked think it's answer A. How many of you think, well, have a little faith in your managers, people. Uh, how many of you think that the managers thought it was the answer of B? All right, so let's, for the viewers at home, that's, I think, about like 50% of the people in the room. So probably the other half was going to think they answered C, right? Who thinks it's C? Most people answered C. I'm actually going to give you the answer, of course, but I'm going to give it to you a little later in the presentation. All right, so 
stick with us. Um, who am I? Well, <laughs> I'm the CISO uh, for the Dutch Authority for Consumers and Markets. We are a regulatory authority in the Netherlands. We regulate, well, consumers and markets. Uh, so we make sure there's no uh, monopolies or that kind of thing in markets like, uh, like hospital care or energy markets or that kind of thing. And I used to be the CISO for DIVD, but now I'm a board member. And of course, the IVD, uh, we are a, a group of volunteers that scan the internet and um, for mostly known vulnerabilities and try to get the uh, people that are vulnerable to patch or update or fix their systems, as well as um, responsibly disclosing zero days or helping people disclose zero days in a responsible way. And um, yeah, we do that voluntarily. And I have a background in criminology and justice. I have a master's degree in, gym, in criminology and I used to work for the police in Amsterdam. Enough about me. Anyway, is it gonna work? Ugh. So um, let's talk a little bit about how pentas are traditionally set up. Uh, first thing I wanna say is, of course you all know this, but there's a difference between a pen test and a scan. Like a scan is automated and I refer to a pen test as a manual thing, like, um, it's actually a person doing the test, it's not a script. I'm not saying one is better than the other. There are perfectly legitimate reasons to go for a scan as opposed to a pen test. But in this presentation, when I'm talking about a pen test, I mean a manual pen test, not a scan, just to make that clear. Um, my experience is that most times when you order a pen test from a vendor, the details are decided and proposed to you by the vendor. So the vendor is going to tell you, you have an Office 365 application here. I would suggest you would test it for authorization, authentication, that kind of thing. So the vendor will ask you as a CISO, would you like this and this and this tested? As opposed to the CISO saying, I want this and this and this tested. Usually a CISO just says, I want my, I don't know, SharePoint tested, that kind of thing. And then usually the, the pen testers, they do the test, they make a report, and then the CISO kind of translates that report back to the board or management because they can't actually read the report. <laughs> it's blah, blah, blah to them. Uh, so you as a CISO have to take the report, m make sure you get the main findings, and then translate that in a language your board or your managers understand to, get, uh, to make sure you get funding or you know, get everything fixed. And this is something that's not mine, of course. As a pen tester, you've probably heard that a lot, but it's very, very true. Your test is as good as your report. Uh, you can have the most amazing pen test. If you cannot write it down in a way that people understand, there's really no point. Nothing's gonna happen with your findings. Um, so that's something I really wanted to, to emphasize here, as well as the fact that um, there is really no point to having a very shiny, perfect report if there is no actual follow-up. Now that's something that's not your responsibility as a pen tester most of the time, but uh, there are things that a CISO can do to make sure a pen test gets followed up on. So you can write a perfect report, but still if no one does anything with it, it ends up in a drawer, what's the point? So in my opinion, there are some relevant questions here. How do you set up such a good pen test as a CISO? How do you write a good report? as a tester, and how do you work together to make sure it gets a proper follow-up? That would be the optimum outcome. So setting up a good pen test as a CISO, to me, means that you take the lead. So you handle a pen test like you would a project. You make sure there's a planning. You make sure there's a scope that you decide on. So it's not the vendor that comes to you and says, would you like your SharePoint tested for authentication issues or that kind of thing or any you know, uh, files that are hanging around in the wrong places. That's something you need to discuss with the owner inside your organization of SharePoint to make sure that that's actually what you want to get tested. Maybe there are things that happened in the past, like certain incidents that make you doubt certain configuration uh, decisions that might be something you want to get tested. So instead of leaning back and letting the vendor tell you what you should test, it should be more proactive as a CISO and make sure that you decide together with the owner of the, the application or the system what gets tested. 
Um, and you need to write that down. So you make a clear scoping document, and then you're not even there yet. You take the scoping document, you go to your pen testers, and you say, can you do this? <laughs> because it's great when you have a fantastic goals or you've written everything down, but if your pen testers actually can't test that because they don't have the tools or the knowledge or whatever, then what's the point? So you're like a bridge between the pen testers and the owner of the application. You make sure there's uh, things arranged for, for the test to be you know, carried out, and you make sure that the scope is clear and it's doable. So you need to make sure you have goals. You need to write them down. You also need to write down what techniques are allowed. Are your pen testers allowed to use social engineering? This sometimes can be ethically this, uh, something to be discussed. So write down what is allowed, but also write down the limitations. If you don't want them to use certain tooling, if you don't want them to do certain things, make sure you write it down in advance so they know. And a few helpful tips. Um, add some technical details to your scoping document. So a lot of the time, these tests are either white or gray box. They're hardly ever black box, because you don't have that kind of time or money when you do a, a pen test. If you want a true black box pen test, you usually go for a buck bounty, that kind of thing. So usually, these things are white and gray box anyway. Um, I'm going to get back to that in a little bit. So I like to add some architecture drawings. Of course, they are never completely up to date, because they never are. But you know, whatever you can give your pen testers as something to hang on to, it can be helpful. And it can also uh, make sure they don't spend a lot of time searching for things on the network, because they can just look it up. Uh, if there are certain settings in your antivirus, your IDS, IPS, that kind of thing, that might go off, because usually when you're pen testing, um, and it's not in a, in a developmental stage, but it's an in-production system, you don't really want all the antivirus uh, alerts to go off and that kind of thing. It's just annoying. So sometimes it just helps to tell your pen test in advance, if you do this, then that will probably happen. Uh, you might want to avoid doing that because, you know, IT people are humans too. So, um, like I said earlier, what kind of tooling you're allowed or not allowing might be helpful. And of course, boundaries. And with boundaries, I don't really mean tooling, but with boundaries, I mean network boundaries. You don't want your pen testers hacking into your vendor's network because you're, there's a connection there, or your neighbors, or whoever. You want them to stay within your own network. But in order for them to do that, you need to tell them what the boundaries are. So which IP addresses are within the limits of your network, and which ones, if they spot that, they have to go, ooh, uh, have to go back here. <laughs> And involve your IT apartment, I think, well, it sounds like very obvious, but sometimes people forget. So the IT department doesn't know there's a pen test going on, antivirus alerts are going off, uh, your, your nice IT admins are tearing their hair out going, what the F is going on? Uh, well, a surprise pen test. Um, yeah, you want to avoid that. So I would involve them, I would tell them in advance, we're going to do this test. Is this all right? Do you have any large uh, migrations planned for this period for this application? Might also be a valid question to ask in advance. Um, and even if you do that, like I did, sometimes it still goes wrong. <laughs> I involved the, the IT department very, very uh, timely, everything. I even made sure that the accounts that we gave to the pen testers had very obvious names. Pen tester one, pen tester two. And then uh, I always make sure I'm available in the week that we do the test, because if things go wrong, you know, people can call me. So I got a call. First, I got a call from the pen testers going, our accounts are locked. I'm like, that's not good. Like five minutes later, I get a phone call from the IT department. We locked their accounts. I'm like, why? <laughs> And they go, well, uh, they, uh, we spotted them uh, downloading hackers' tools. So we, we, yeah, we disabled their accounts, because that's what we do in a normal situation. I'm like, it's not a normal situation. These are pen testers. Yeah, but we blocked their account, like we're supposed to do. I'm like, that's awesome. What are they going to do now? Go home? We paid them money to do this. <laughs> so yeah, um, then they had to enable the accounts again. And fortunately, it was around lunchtime, so the pen testers could go grab lunch and then go back to work. But you know, uh, even though you do this with the best intentions, sometimes it still goes wrong. Some things you must never forget 
uh, a disclaimer. I don't, I don't really know if this is the correct English word in Dutch. I would say a vrijwaringsverklaring. Um, so you need to make sure that there's no legal action that's going to be taken to your pen testers if they make mistakes. For us, we usually put in the disclaimer that as long as they follow everything in the scoping documents, the disclaimer is valid. If they do anything that's not in the scoping documents, <coughs> lockers, um, you know, luck of the draw, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, so in Dutch, we have a VOG, a uh, Verklaring omtrent gedrag. If you work for, uh, if you're a pen tester for a government organization, we ask you to give us this document. It states that you have no, uh, not a criminal record that is related to the work you're going to be doing for us. Um, but it's optional because it's not all. Uh, it's only for government. Well, it's not actually only for government, I, I believe. It's, you can ask for it if you're in a company as well. But usually for government, it's mandatory. Um, of course, you, have, you ask them to sign a confidentiality agreement. You ask them to sign this because, um, uh, like, like, if you have a responsible disclosure, this is kind of a wobbly area. You would not always uh, ask for a confidentiality agreement. In this case, when it's a pen test, however, you're paying people to do something for you, and you're also giving them information, as opposed to when it's a responsible disclosure, someone finds a vulnerability somewhere in your system, and they found it independently. But we're actually telling the pen testers things about our network, our antivirus settings, our firewall settings, our parameter, that kind of thing. So you want this to stay confidential. So it's a different kind of situation. And uh, when there's going to be social engineering on site, make sure that you give them a written statement with its signature. I do this for, from the CIO usually, um, because yeah, it's kind of a hassle when you have to go pick up your pen tester from the police office. So it's like, easier if they have like a statement, they can show your security that they're supposed to be trying to social engineer people in the building, um, which is why I, uh, I would give you this tip. And then there's a little bit of boring stuff. If you have a larger test that is spanning multiple days, make sure you have a planning. Like first day, they start here. Their goal is to reach this point in the network or to like get admin, uh, that kind of thing. Make sure you plan it out because you want to have as much tested as you possibly can. You're paying for this test. You want them to test as many things as possible. And of course, some practical arrangements. So you need to make sure that from it for like timely in advance, you give them access passes, password logins, 2FA tokens, that sort of thing, because these things sometimes take longer than you think. And then that's just what I was talking about earlier. Why would you give a pen tester um, credentials or two-factor authentication? You do this because if you don't and you just tell them, hack this application, I'm going to give you nothing there's a chance that they're going to spend the entire week or whatever time you gave them trying to get into the system. That doesn't mean your system is secure because an outside attacker has all the time in the world to get in and your pen tester only has five days. So if your pen tester had all the time in the world, he probably would have gotten in or she anyway. But they don't. You only gave them five days. So that's why in some cases I give the pen testers credentials not to use immediately, that's why you need a planning. So you tell them, day one, you try and break in from the parameter. If you can't get in in day one, write down whatever you found and how you think you would have gotten, maybe would have gotten in if you had more time. Then day two, use user credentials, lowest type of uh, authentication, authorization, see how far you get there, and so on, and so on, and so on. Because you have to assume breach anyway. You have to assume that if someone has unlimited time and money, they would get through your parameter. And um, you want to make sure that all the layers are tested, not just your parameter, because it's a waste of money otherwise. Now, for something a little different, I'm just wondering, who knows what this word means? If you know what the word means, you know what it means? You were first, I saw it. Um, maybe, is it possible that you can use the microphone? Can you use the microphone and say what it means? <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Another English word for this bullshit. Exactly. Or more, you know, nuanced. It's a language that is meaningless or made unintelligible by excessive use of technical terms. Now, a lot of pen testers in their reports tend to use this type of language. For managers. Like I said in the beginning, checksum, 
might be difficult. But what I asked the managers that I also did the poll with earlier, I was like, well, while they're here, might as well ask them some other stuff. I asked them, what would you like to see in a pen test report? So now remember, these are non-IT managers. These are directors, board members, that kind of uh, thing. They're also not representative of all the managers in the world. They're just a handful of Dutch managers. So it's just for fun. But what they said was they at least want the top three findings. They want a suggestion on the fixes of these top three findings. They want a management summary. Uh, they want a cost estimate of how much they think you think it might cost to fix this. And they're interested to know if this whatever you found is being exploited into the, in the wild. None of them wanted the whole technical story. That was an option they could choose. No one chose that option. They do not care, which doesn't mean you shouldn't put it in there. I'm going to get to that in a second. You should, but it's just in a different way. So why are we writing reports this way? Why are we writing reports in a way that managers actually don't care about? Because it's not aimed at managers. We write pen testing reports for technical people. We write them for the IT department. We write them for the CISO. We never write pen testing reports for board or managers. And that's why it's in technical terms, because it's meant for technical people. But there's a very distinct language difference there. A lot of us think that we know what managers know. They think certain words are normal in everyday language, which they actually aren't. But we, as technical people, tend to hang out with technical people. That's our group of people. That's our frame of reference. So that's our language. Um, so we're kind of living in a bubble. And then CISOs are left to translate, but they're not always very good at that. Um, so that's not really an optimal uh, setup, in my opinion, because the people that we write these pen testing reports for are not actually the people that are the ones that make the decisions or that have the budget. Sometimes CISOs have a budget. I personally don't. I don't need it. But um, uh, a lot of the times, the people you write the report for are not the people that make the decision on what to do with your findings. Uh, another problem that you kind of run into a lot is that an internal CISO's opinion is valued surprisingly less than an external expert's. So when an external expert says this is a serious problem, a board member or a manager is more likely to believe you than if a CISO says it because the CISO says it six times a week. Um, and the external expert is someone from the outside and you know exotic and new and you've never seen that person before. So if he says that it's serious, then it's probably something you should take serious. And also, CISOs just sometimes don't understand the reports, or they misinterpret findings, and are just not very good at translating. Sometimes. Sometimes they're very good, but sometimes they're not. Um, and this way, you become a gateway between the expert and the management. It's kind of like what you did in preschool, where you whisper a word in, in someone's ear, and they have to whisper it in the next person's ear, and the next person's ear, and at the other end, a t totally different word comes out. That kind of stuff happens. And as a result, your board doesn't always get to see or feel how serious certain findings are because you're a CISO and you're always yelling at them that things are going wrong and we have to do something right now. And they tend to be kind of right. Also, they tend to get a little numb sometimes, which is something we need to fix. But hey, I'm just saying. Um, so how do you write better reports? Like I said, um, a lot of them just want a management summary. A lot of pen testers actually do this. They write a management summary. But then the management summary is sometimes 10 pages long, which manage managers tend not to have time for. So I would say make a management summary that's maximum one page and make it so that you know, it's readable to them. There's no jargon, no gobbledygook in your management summary. Uh, make sure there's the top three to five findings. It, I'm not saying you shouldn't put any other findings in. I'm just saying not in a management summary. For the managers, just give them the top three of the worst things that you found and what is needed to fix them. And then have the rest of your findings in an attachment in technical terms. Because eventually, someone's going to have to fix all these things. So it's important what you found. How can we re replicate this? Uh, and you have to do this in technical terms, because you just can't get there if you're talking uh, like a toddler. So you're going to have to 
make sure that there's technical information there, but just put it in the back <laughs> uh, so that everyone can use your report. The managers can use your report, the CISO can use your report, and the technical people that need to go fix these things can also use your report. And add screenshots uh, and evidence because, you know, it's just more fun to look at and it makes it easier to replicate and it scares the hell out of managers. Um, and then the follow-up. Like I said, it's great. You have this wonderful report. You had a great pen test. Lots of wonderful findings. Great report. But then the follow-up. This is a job for your CISO. So how do you get the, um, the, the follow-up done? You need to make sure that you let the experts do the talking, if you can. Sometimes pen testers aren't really keen on talking to board members, but if you estimate that they're, you know, they're good at, at explaining what they did, have them have a presentation for your managers and your board where they explain themselves their top three findings, um, have them talk it over with you in the, before to make sure there's no difficult words in there, and um, then have them do this, this presentation where they explain the top findings that they did, and um, your board and your managers can actually ask them questions. How did you do this? Why is this important? That kind of thing. And then hammer them on their responsibilities. So tell them, all right, we have this report, we have these findings, you are the owner of this application, or you are the manager, or you are the board. If we do not follow up on this, uh, that's your decision. I'm going to write you an email, a memo, or whatever, and please sign. Sign that you decided not to follow up on these things, or uh, I'm going to give you an advice on how to follow up on it, and then please uh, uh, say that you want this followed up on, like in, in writing, and then we'll get it followed up on. And like I said, have the experts uh, explain. So this presentation is not finished yet. I'm still going to give you the answer of the poll in the beginning and some main points. But up until now, are there any questions? I'm just coming back on yeah, stage sorry. to help with um, yeah, moderating this part of it. So uh, anyone who has a question, feel free to line up at the microphone. Another thing also, uh, those of you who are watching online can also send in questions. So uh, also for the uh, signal angel, do we have any online questions yet? Nope. Okay, great, go ahead. Yes, uh, you said you write your reports in, or you, we should write our reports in two levels, a business level and a technical level. I'd like to write my reports in three levels. I start with my management summary, which is totally business language, uh, as little technical words as possible. Not even saying VPN, no, the network of the company. And then when I start writing my findings, my individual findings, I always like write a user story kind of thing. So as an attacker that is able to connect to the network, I can steal your data. Mm -hmm. So you can explain what is the risk uh, with each finding separately. So if a manager like starts flipping through the findings itself, they can see, oh, there's a risk of people stealing data, stealing money, exposing our secrets to the internet, uh, things that, and then I can just start on with all the technical details. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah, I would say do that as well. I, I didn't really mention it, but I kind of assumed that's something you would uh, follow up on after the management summary. So it's not a management summary attachments, it's management summary, and then you kind of elaborate exactly like you said, maybe not in a user story, that kind of ta that's a taste mm -hmm. thing, but uh, elaborate on what does it mean that we found this thing? Yeah, that's, that's perfect, yeah. Go ahead, Oscar. How do you deal with, uh, how do you deal with the situation that uh, managers push the document, the, the report back to you as the expert or the IT people because they are responsible for the infrastructure? How do you deal with the situation where these managers are just pushing it back to you again? Well, they, they really can't because what, what happens is there's the pen testing report they get the presentation where you know, there's, there's explanation about what was found, and then they get uh, advice on how to fix it, and, they, and we tell them to make a decision. So I usually, what I usually do when we have a pen test report, I take the, the most important findings. Of course, the, the little findings, the, like the quick fixes, we don't even discuss those. I just give them to the IT department, and I go, please go fix this, and they'll fix it. It's 
quick, dirty, easy, whatever. But the, the main findings, the big ones, I usually go to the managers and I give them an advice and I give them usually two options. So for example, we had a phishing vulnerability and I said you can put a VPN before this portal or you can put very serious monitoring on it, or both, preferably both, but um, give them options. Because I, my experience is managers and board members, they like to have something to choose. Not too much, because then it gets too hard. But give them options to choose from, and then you force them to make a decision. They can't really say, well, let the IT department decide this, because what I would say is they, can, they can't make that decision because they need money or they need uh, um, people or whatever, something is needed more than we have right now in order to fix this. A VPN costs money, uh, a SIM costs money, so they can't really push it to the IT department because it's not their field of decision making. Hello. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hendrik. Yeah, Hendrik. Hendrik. I have a small question, but it's a bit the position of the CISO and the pen test inside the organization. Uh, to give you slightly an idea, in the late 1980s I was in Delft University and I had to uh, approve of with some people on a uh, military raid attack on a nuclear reactor. That's a very rough kind of pen test. What part of the department? Who's deciding the doing the pen test? Uh, is there a, what's the CISO? Is it is general security or is it IT? That's a very good question, actually. I think it depends on the maturity of your organization. So the organization where I'm working right now, we still have a ways to go, which is normal because we're government. Um, but so I kind of ease them into it. So I say, well, you are the owner of a critical application. Uh, according to our policy, your applications should be tested, pen tested every, once every two years. Uh, your last pen test was two years ago or never. Um, and then I go to them and I say, well, according to our policy, it should be tested. It's going to cost you about this amount of money. It's going to cost you about this amount of time from your uh, part of the organization. It will give you this information. We're going to expect you to do that with it. So I kind of walk them through the whole process. And, then go, and I do this a year in advance because I make uh, year plans for my team. So I'm going to ask them a year in advance, would you like us to test your application next year? You should be saying yes because you're owner of critical application, blah, blah. In, I've never experienced them saying no, but if they would ever say no, there's two things I can do as a CISO. I can go to the CIO and say, hey, this owner of this critical application is supposed to get their applica application tested because this is the policy. They are refusing this right now. What do you want to do? And then the CIO can escalate it. They can talk to that owner or they can go to the board or they can just say, it's fine with me. If the CIO says it's fine with me, the CIO trumps me in my organization, so I would just make sure I get it in writing uh, and I, I, have it, I have it stored uh, away, fine, we'll go to a different application. But if that application gets attacked or we get hacked because of that application that's not tested or that's, that's vulnerable, I would say, you know, that's on the CIO and the owner because they made that decision not to test it. So that's how I usually handle uh, that kind of thing. It depends on the organization because there's organizations where, you know, it's standard to test uh, every new application or it's standard to test every application that's in development. It depends. But that's just how I handle it. So, <clears throat> Signal Angel, uh, are there any uh, questions from online? Can you read it, please? There was one question, but this already answered. Oh, ah, OK. Excellent. There is more space for questions. So I'm going to give you guys all still an opportunity to come up. Uh, in the meanwhile, there actually is one question for me, something that uh, I was wondering. Um, so you mentioned that you would like for the pen testing companies to deliver a cost estimate of what it might cost for the organization to fix uh, the vulnerabilities. Given the fact that we're a third party without intimate knowledge of your organization and IT infrastructure beyond what we saw <laughs> during the pen test, uh, how can we as third parties be able to make this kind of an evaluation? It's actually not something I said you should do. It's just what the managers that I did the poll with 
said they would like. Um, but you're completely right, it's not very realistic to ask this. But what you could do is have them kind of estimate it. Like, it doesn't have to be a, a how you say, offerta, I don't know the English word. Um, it doesn't have to be like a, a precise number, but you could say it's probably between this and that amount of money if they really want to have a cost estimate. In my experience, I'm usually the one that does that. So when I write the advice that's based on the pen test report, I make a cost estimate for my board and I say it's probably going to cost you this much if you choose option A or if you choose option B because that's the thing. The pen test report usually doesn't uh, specifically say you should do this to fix this finding. It usually says you should do something about your authentication or your whatever, and then it's up to the organization to, s to make a decision on if they want that VPN for their portal or monitoring to tackle a phishing attack. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got another question here. Um, Gert, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Fleur. So there was a lot of wisdom in this presentation, and thank you for that. And I would hope to get a little bit more of your wisdom. Um, and I know you cannot be extremely specific in your answer, but when you are looking for parties to do a pen test for you, are there some things that give you good vibes or things that give you bad vibes? Because one day I will need a pen tester, and I would like to have some clues on how to find out the good ones. So I like, I like companies where I get to talk to pen testers. So I don't get to talk to a salesperson, but I call them, I say, well, I'm going to need a pen test for this or this application. Um, uh, can, you, can you do this? Do you actually do this? Uh, sometimes uh, they say, we don't have time or whatever. Um, and then if they do have time, I always ask, can I talk to one of your pen testers? Because I'd like to discuss with them the, what we want them to test and the way we want it tested, and I want to make sure that you can do it. And sometimes that's not even a possibility. You don't get to talk to pen testers. You just get a salesperson that wants you to jot down a date. Uh, and when the date is dis decided upon, then the whole pen tester you never see, hear, or talk to, you just get a, a no for, for you an anonymous report back uh, by someone, someone you never talked to before. And uh, there's all these findings and whatever. I don't like that. I want to talk to the pen testers. I want to discuss things with them. Um, that's, that's the most important criteria, I would say. Uh, and also, as a CISO, it's, it's helpful if you kind of dive into that world. You don't have to become a pen tester, but it helps if you recognize that a report is sent in to you and it's just an automated scan. Um, <laughs> that's not what you're trying to, to, to get. Like, it's fine to use automated tools, don't get me wrong, but you want a pen tester to elaborate on the, on the findings they get from the tools. Um, so yeah, that's why I said, that's what I would look for. I look for, are you able to talk to the people that are going to actually do the test? And make sure that you, as a CISO, can see if work is actually qualit qualitatively good or it's just an automated scan. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I would like to ask about scope, because you were talking about scope. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I like to go a little bit outside of scope. Because where I was educated in pen testing, we were providing network security and not host security. And uh, so my question is, uh, out of curiosity, I'm based in Denmark and we are pragmatic, so I don't get into trouble. But I would like to hear if that's the same case in Netherlands. And then I have a follow-up question to that. If I find something which is a little bit of an out of scope, say the router in front of the environment is really, really badly configured, would you have it included in the report? Or would you rather have that in an email outside of the report? So I didn't really hear Sorry. the last question. Uh, if I find something that is out of scope, yeah. like the router in front of the network, mm -hmm. which is badly configured, yeah. would you like that in an email outside of the report or oh, as right. an appendix? So, yeah. so if you find something that's actually out of scope, would you still want it in the report? Um, I'll give you the answer what we did with the lockers. We put it in the report. It was out of the scope. We actually put a picture of it in the report. <laughs> And looking back, might not have been his wisest decision, but we did. Uh, it's a finding. So yeah, it was out of scope, and uh, um, it, it might have gotten me into a little trouble, but it's still a finding, and I think it's relevant, and I think it's important, and we should still do something about it. So as long as you are not too far out of scope, 
uh, where I cannot defend you anymore as a CISO, then you're good. I will, I will try and, and you know, work it into the report in a way that I still think it's defendable. But I think it's also a little bit of common sense of the pen tester. Like, it's fine, like I said, if you find something that's a little out of scope, it's different when you actually actively go looking for things that are out of scope. That's, I would say, the, the limit. So any, and actually, um, I, I uh, uh, tell pen testers, if you find things along the way that are actually out of scope, but you, you kind of stumble upon it, mention it, put it in the report. That's, that's totally okay, yeah. I was wondering, how do you see the role of the CISO in handling the stakeholder management on um, like your side? As, as a project manager for pen testing, I've often encountered parties that are very defensive yeah. You know, they're afraid that they're going to be um, blamed for having uh, their job badly done while, in essence, pen testing is to help the organization to improve and get better. And there, there is a bit of a shift in that, but it's still, they feel, still feel like a slap on the hands. Yeah, it's very important. First of all, that's, uh, the stakeholder management uh, part is very important. That's why I said in the presentation, you need to make sure that you get your owners involved in the whole process. So you go to them, you establish the goals. What do we want to get tested right now? Um, what is the goal of this test? And um, you, you make sure that they're involved in the, in the end of the process where they get the presentation and they can ask the questions, um, that sort of thing. So make sure that they're involved in the whole process. It's not just a cold report on their desk after a few weeks that says you've done all this wrong but they are part of the testing process. Another thing I find very important is that you look at the ethics side of things. So uh, if, if you know me a little bit, you know I'm very against fake phishing emails <laughs> because I think they're ethically very wrong. Uh, so I would never send out a fake phishing email to do a phishing test in my organization and make sure everyone knows that. So uh, also another thing is, that's why I said involve your IT department. Make sure they know that this test is coming because you don't want them to feel sneaked up on um, as well as if you do uh, a certain, certain tests that might make their work harder, you need to make sure they know this in advance. And also when we come with the findings, the first thing, there's also a presentation for your technical people. So I talked, I forgot to mention this. You do a presentation for the board and the managers, but you also let the pen testers do a presentation of their findings for your IT department. So they can ask questions and they know what was tested and found. And I always make sure that they know you didn't do everything wrong. It's not that you do, don't do your job right. It's just how can we do even better? Um, so yeah, very important. Yeah. I'm going to have you, you're the last question, and then we're going to finish because, uh, you know, <laughs> people want to know the answer to the poll problem. Last one, yay. <laughs> yay. Um, uh, I'm doing auditing, and, and lately I'm, I've seen a lot of, uh, kind of uh, well, some pen test reports so that they are formulated, so that they are kind of, uh, kind of risk, uh, formulated as a, as a risk for IT, and usually for a risk for ISO 27001 or something else that they are like, this is a risk you should, so they um, can kind of be lifted directly to the risk management side of, of things. What's your take on, is that a good way or kind of lazy way of doing it? So what you're saying is you're in auditing and when there's a pen test done, then... Yeah, I'm just reading lots of pen testing reports, and I've seen those that they are like, pen test has been done, and then it's... Oh, they the, don't the really care results. what's in it, it's just, uh, you know, we've, yeah, we've done a pen test, and it doesn't matter what the quality no, is, I mean, right? I mean, the pen testing results are, are formulated as a risk, that you have this oh, right. risk, and then <laughs> you should maybe do this, and you can kind of ah. use that in risk There's management. something to be said for that. Um, because uh, in my eyes, security is very close to risk management, uh, and your risk appetite can be different than in other organizations. Uh, as a criminologist, <laughs> what I like to say is, uh, it's, you don't have to make your home an unpenetrable fort to make sure it doesn't get broken into, it just has to be harder than the neighbor's house. <laughs> because most uh, people that break into homes are opportunists, 
and they just have a look and see the easiest house to get into, that's the one they break into. And hackers, or criminals, I must say, are uh, very akin to that. So they'll likely break into your network if it's easier than other people's networks to break into, or if they're APTs, they're looking for something in specific. But that's just a risk factor that you have to uh, make, be accountable for. So yeah, I, I agree that sometimes you, it's a good idea to have a pen test and uh, treat it as a risk, uh, uh, something you need to either accept or do something about. Because some, you don't have to do you know, not all findings in a pen test report need necessarily get followed up on. Sometimes they are just interesting or mild findings that would take disproportionately amount of time or money to get fixed, and the risk of what happens if they get uh, abused are very low. Well, that's just something a manager needs to you know, think about. Thank you. So, let's have a look. Remember that we did the poll with the managers and we asked them, what the word checksum meant, and like 50% of you thought it was the answer of B, and uh, another 50 C, so you really have no faith in your managers, which you were correct in, because most managers actually thought that the checksum is a sum of multiple vulnerable systems that have been checked for the same known vulnerability over the course of multiple tests. Don't use the word checksum in your management summaries, people. <laughs> um, but the main points I'm trying to make here are when you're a leader, uh, when you're a CISO, you need to lead the test, you need to coordinate, don't sit back and let the vendor decide what they want your application to be tested for, that's your job. Um, you need to address responsibility because that's how you get it followed up on. You need to write uh, quality reports and be able to talk to a board if you're a pen tester. Well, that might be a little bit of a bold statement, but at least you know, try and see if you can get there. Um, and don't use language managers don't understand in your management summary. You'll be surprised. Really kind of use language you would use with um, a toddler, even though they aren't. But I'm afraid that's, uh, that's what, f in our frame of mind, you should do. They are not toddlers, but that's how we would uh, think about it. So if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, that's where you can find me. I have actually a bonus slide that I saved because I asked them another question. I still have like one minute or something. Um, I also asked them, it's in Dutch, so I'll translate, I also asked them what the word PowerShell means. <laughs> uh, about 53% of the managers I asked think that PowerShell is a popular operating system that hackers use to uh, like disclose vulnerabilities to each other. And uh, thanks to uh, Bert, who uh, kindly offered me this, uh, this third option that uh, many chose, another 43% uh, or 14% uh, think that uh, PowerShell is actually a module in Microsoft PowerPoint that runs code in the background. But 43% of managers actually knew what PowerShell meant. It's a way to automate uh, uh, tasks in computers that a lot of admins use. So, sorry? As, as a lot of people had, had this uh, right, I didn't use it because it's less fun. But yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for this really excellent talk. So, before you leave, you need to know that there's another really exciting talk coming up next. So, we've already heard from uh, one board member here of the DEVD, the Dutch uh, Institute for Vulnerability Disclosure. Our next talk uh, here at 7 o'clock in Abacus is scanning and reporting vulnerabilities for the whole IPv4 space, how David Day scales up coordinated vulnerability yeah. disclosure. Um, so I would recommend stick around and uh, thank you for coming.